Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. What you did not hear in this introduction, which I deeply appreciate, was that uh, a couple of weeks ago I called Mauricio and I uh, asked him if he had any advice for me as I prepared my talk. And he said, yes, Larry, I do. Uh, when you give your talk, remember, do not attempt to be smart, charming, or intelligent. Just, just be yourself. So, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, it's some of the best advice I've had lately, and uh, I will try to adhere to it. Well, I uh, want to discuss with you what I consider one of the great... Uh, 800-pound gorillas in the living room of modern medicine, which I never had a lecture on in medical school, and that is what happens when we die. Now, one of my heroes in consciousness research in uh, the past few decades was uh, Ian Stevenson, who many of you will recognize as the man who reported thousands of cases of children who ostensibly remember previous lives. And Dr. Stevenson said once, it has been wisely said that the question of life after death is the most important question that a scientist or anybody else can ask. Well, there hasn't been a lot of asking about that in my profession in recent times, but there have been some trailblazers, and one of those in the 20th century was Carl Jung. And Jung said that the decisive question for man is, is he related to something infinite or not? That's the telling question of his life. And this was so important for Jung that he made this a principle in his interaction with his patients. As a doctor, he said, I make every effort to strengthen the belief in immortality. Now, I'll tell you why I think this is an important topic. I happen to believe that the fear of complete and total annihilation with death has caused more suffering in human history than all the physical diseases combined. Now, we Americans particularly are famously uh, indisposed to address this issue of what happens when we die. And there was an in-your-face book published in 1974 which won the Pulitzer Prize. It was Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death. And he confronted with our, our, our society more forcefully than anybody before or since, I think, with our incredible capacity to deny the obvious. That so far, the statistics are very impressive. <laughs> Everybody dies. Now, after the publication of this book, there were a lot, there's a lot of nervous chatter in the culture about uh, the inevitability of death. One was from Woody Allen. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> One of my favorite jazz guitarists and singers is the late Albert King who said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. There's a famous uh, prolific uh, British novelist who has, has sort of been forgotten, Susan Ertz. She wrote dozens of books. Susan said, millions long for immortality who don't know what to do on a rainy afternoon. <laughs> now, I'm going to be using some terms that uh, I think need some introduction and definition. If you don't get your definitions right, you can really pay for that. Uh, here's how that works. Uh, here, here's a guy who's drowning, and he says to his faithful dog on the shore, Lassie, get help. Lassie, being a good dog, gets help. That's the dumbest cartoon I have. Uh, it, it gets better. So what about this business of the soul? Well, 
I think the di dictionary definition is pretty, pretty good. Uh, it says the soul is the spiritual or immaterial part of a human being or animal regarded as immortal. But I want to do what I consider a modern uh, revision of that definition. And I simply want to say that the soul is the non-local aspect of who we are. And we will cone down on that in a bit. As far as consciousness is concerned, I follow Ramakrishna Rao here, uh, a consciousness researcher working in India. Consciousness is a fundamental principle that underlies all knowing and being. In a fundamental sense, consciousness is the source of awareness. It is what makes awareness possible. Now, if we try to get on a path that would lead us to the concept of immortality, how, how, might, how might we do that? Well, I think there are a lot of approaches to this question of the soul and immortality. Here's just a short list. For some people, religion and scripture, faith and revelation are quite sufficient. For other people, mediums are where it's happening, who inform us of the other side. Other people put a lot of stock in near-death experiences, and there are only 15 million Americans by now who have had near-death experiences. Other people are influenced by children and other people who have memories of previous lives. But for me, the most interesting aspect of this dialogue is fairly new, and it's just what I lump into what I call consciousness research. Now, and we'll be enlarging on this category as we go along. Now, I think it's helpful to understand from the get-go that all talk of the soul is currently absolutely prohibited in conventional science. The reason it is is this. We say that consciousness is essentially the same thing as the brain. And so when the brain dies, everything that you refer to as consciousness and what is you vanishes. Now, this is not... Uh, 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 really a minor view, it's dominant. Uh, for example, Stephen Hawking recently said that, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There's no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That's a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. So how on earth do we justify a belief in immortality in an age when this possibility is absolutely denied in mainstream science. I happen to believe that we can make a strong case for immortality in the soul by going in one or both directions. If we could say or prove that consciousness is fundamental, that would go a long way toward establishing life in some sense after death. Because if we say consciousness is fundamental, that means it can't be derived from anything more basic. It stands on its own. It isn't produced by anything. That's what we mean by fundamental. Or if we could show that consciousness is non-local, by which we mean infinite, infinite in space and time, that also would get us there. Because I want to remind you, and you can re go read up on the five points of uh, non-locality if you wish, but if something is non-local with respect to space, then it's infinite in space. That is to say, it's omnipresent. And if something is non-local, it is infinite in time, meaning it is eternal and immortal. And if something is infinite in space and time, then it is unbounded. You cannot separate it from all the other consciousnesses that are out there. So that in some sense, consciousness and minds come together and form what many have called the one mind. This kind of talk is alive and well in medicine. Uh, one of the best books, which is a bestseller in, uh, in Europe, by the way, is by Dr. Penn van Lommel, who is a distinguished cardiologist in Holland. His book, Consciousness Beyond Life, contains this comment. I strongly believe that consciousness cannot be located in a particular time and place. This is known as non-locality. Complete and endless consciousness is everywhere. Near-death experiences prompted the concept of non-local and endless consciousness. Ultimately, we cannot avoid the conclusion that consciousness has always been and always will be independent of the body. 
Now, none of that kind of view has any currency in conventional science for the reasons I've already mentioned. We identify consciousness with the brain. In spite of the very inconvenient fact that no human being, as far as we know, has ever observed consciousness being produced by the brain or by anything else. Still, the ideology persists that consciousness is identical with the brain. Here's what Marvin Minsky, who was uh, for many years uh, head of the uh, artificial intelligence lab at MIT said, the brain is just a computer made of meat. <laughs> you know, you chuckle at this, <laughs> But he did not mean this in a funny way. Neither did Karen Stoltz now, who is a linguist in Australia, who says, thinking is just the meat talking to itself. It's generated by the brain, and when we die, unfortunately, that dies with us. We can state that categorically. Now, uh, associated with this view is that there is no direction, purpose, are meaning whatsoever in the universe. As David Lindley, the distinguished astrophysicist, has said, we humans are just crumbs of organic matter clinging to the surface of one tiny rock. Cosmically, we're no more significant than mold on a shower curtain. <laughs> are you beginning to feel really warm and fuzzy about uh, <laughs> being human? Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg, the more the universe seems comp comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. <laughs> Daniel Dennett, when we consider free will as an illusion or reality, we're looking into an abyss. What seems to confront us is a plunge into nihilism and despair. Now, this is where this conversation goes off the rails. Dennett has also said, we're all zombies. Nobody is consciousness. <laughs> now, I ask you to ponder for a moment the implications of this. If nobody is conscious, neither is Dr. Dennett. <laughs> if we're all zombies, so is he. Why on earth would anybody believe what this man says? Uh, Bertrand Russell, whom I OD'd on back in college days, uh, says that uh, when I die, I shall rot, and nothing of my ego shall remain. I think he was right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did rot, and that uh, nothing of his ego did remain, but as I hope to show you, I think that's not the end of the story. So, just to summarize, in conventional science, mind equals brain, you're your body, nothing more, and when your body dies, all that you die is with it and absolutely nothing survives. Now, there's another side to science. Uh, a few months ago, a few, of, uh, a, a few scholars, including uh, myself, got together and we developed a web website I would like for you to uh, look at if it appeals to you. It's opensciences.org. There's an S on science, so it's opensciences.org. Now, we can make a case for immortality. Let me just say it once again. If we can show one uh, or two things here. One is that consciousness is fundamental. Now, if we look at the opinions that have been offered in the 20th century by some of the greatest uh, patriarchs and matriarchs of modern science, you may be surprised about what you can find about this issue of fundamental nature of consciousness. Uh, I, I really get tired of hearing skeptics say that the idea that consciousness is fundamental is just something that was dreamed up by California hippies back in the 60s. This is absolutely not true. The founder of quantum physics, Max Planck, took the view that consciousness was fundamental. He said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. So he has torn, turned this uh, uh, issue upside down. It's not matter that makes consciousness, it's consciousness that makes matter. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing postulates consciousness. This was not a one-off. 
In uh, the 1920s, uh, this is what Erwin Schrodinger, who won the Nobel Prize in 1933 in physics, said, although I think that life may be the result of an accident, I don't think that about consciousness. Consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms, for consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. He said further, if we have to decide to have only one sphere, it has got to be the psychic one since that exists anyway. This uh, has not gone out of style, this notion that consciousness is fundamental. One of the leading philosophers in mathematics uh, and physics and philosophy of consciousness these days is David Chalmers. I propose that conscious experience can, not, can be I propose that conscious experience be considered a fundamental feature, irreducible to anything more basic. And let me remind you also that we said that we can make a case for the soul if we can also show that consciousness is non-local or infinite in space and time. Again, one of the people who was pivotal with this uh, idea in the 20th century uh, was Carl Jung, who talked about the collective unconscious and the collective unconscious uh, suggesting that there's a point at which our, the expressions of our consciousness come together in unity. Again, Schrodinger was all over this idea. Consciousness is a singular entity. To divide or multiply consciousness is something meaningless. There is obviously only one alternative, namely the unification of minds or consciousness. The overall number of minds is just one. In truth, there is only one mind. David Bohm, who many of you will uh, recognize, one of the great physicists at the second half of the 20th century, if we don't establish these absolute boundaries between minds, then it's possible they could unite as one mind. He said further, deep down the consciousness of mankind is one. This is a virtual certainty. And if we don't see this, it's because we're blinding ourselves to it. Ralph Waldo Emerson got there before the physicists did. There is one mind common to all individual men, a universal mind. There's a heck of a book out there about this. Uh, <laughs> now, there is profound evidence that uh, we humans are profoundly connected non-locally across space and time. And I want to give you an example about what these events actually look like. There's a class of uh, events in consciousness research that have been called telesomatic events. And telesomatic comes from, Greek, from Latin words meaning the distant body. Basically the idea is that two people far apart, it doesn't matter how far apart they are, but if they're emotionally connected, Often, when one person experiences something physical, the other person does also. Here's an example. Long story short, this had uh, to do with Sylvia and Marta Landa, who were little four-year-old identical twin girls. And uh, here's what happened. One day, the father of these little girls decided to take them off to see the grandmother and grandparent, grandfather uh, that were, they were kilometers away from their home. But one of the girls didn't want to go. Uh, she wanted to stay home and help her mom with household chores. Unfortunately, in doing so, she touched her hand to a red hot iron and erupted in a second degree big fat blister on a particular part of the hand, a second degree burn. And at the same time, it turned out that her sister kilometers away erupted at the same time in an identical blister on the same hand, on the same part. This was photographed, doctors got involved, so did a team of psychologists who documented this uh, thing. And this is what these look like. Uh, I don't know how you get this out of material approaches to consciousness, but there you are. We now know that uh, about 20% of identicals experience these sorts of things. And these uh, twins who do experience this sort of thing uh, usually do so because they are emotionally very close. Not all identical twins are emotionally close. Uh, these uh, twins here are uh, 
uh, having fun with this idea that they're connected with their tin, tinfoil helmets here. Actually, these uh, good-looking guys live in London. They have a tremendous following on Facebook. And as far as I can tell, almost all their followers are teenage girls. Yeah. I emphasize this emotional bond. These events usually occur between twins who really have fun with twinship. They enjoy being twins. Here's another example of two little cuties. Uh, I think they would be great, great candidates for this sort of thing. But when you get right down to it, most people who experience these telesomatic, distant, correlated symptoms aren't identical twins. They're just people, ordinary people, who are bonded. Uh, parents and children, spouses, siblings, lovers. And if you want to have fun with this idea, this is the go-to book by Guy Playfair, Twin Telepathy. Now, one of my reasons for being attracted to this whole category of research is I happen to be an identical twin. Uh, oh... Yeah. My, my, my mother would be happy I'm showing the baby pictures uh, here we, we've had stuff like this all of our life when we were growing up we didn't know what was supposed not to happen so we just called it twin stuff uh, uh, to compound the issue I happen to be married to a twin uh, this is my wife Barbara and her twin brother uh, so she and her brother have had events like this that put my brothers and my events to shame. So these uh, non-local events are not just mental, they're profoundly physical as well. Uh, and I want to illustrate this by showing you some recent research that shows that it's not just whole human beings like the twins who get this stuff together. You can look at organs in different people and show that they uh, respond in the same Way. There are at least a dozen experiments now knowing, oh, excuse me, showing that if you're monitoring two brains at a distance with conventional EMG, uh, EEG recordings or fMRI brain scans, when you stimulate one brain, if these people are emotionally close, the distant brain responds in the same way at the same time. If you go down from whole organs to individual cells, you can show the same sort of thing. This was demonstrated by Rita Pizzi and her colleagues in Italy and Milan when they looked at uh, the interaction between human neurons at a distance. They showed the same sort of phenomenon. They took neurons from the brain biopsies of individuals and put them in what are called Faraday cages, which are lead-lined boxes that can uh, are impervious to any kind of electromagnetic uh, signaling. And when they shone a laser light on one batch of neurons, the distant shielded neurons responded instantly in the same way. They said, our experimental data seem to strongly suggest that biological systems present non-local properties not explainable by classical methods. Now, if you look for uh, confirmation of this sort of thing. It's not hard to find. Dr. Ashkan Farhadi and his colleagues at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago showed the same sort of distant interaction, not between human neurons, but between human epithelial cells. And when they poison one bunch of cells with hydrogen peroxide, the distant shielded epithelial cells changed in the same degree at the same time. This was shown also by Dr. Victor Shaban at UCLA School of Medicine, working with neuroblastoma cells and normal human neurons. So what this is beginning to look like is an alternative view in which we say that consciousness is not the equivalent of the brain. As far as we know, brains cannot account for these distant non-local happenings. So an alternative view of consciousness and brain relationships has been springing up for some time. This is just a short list of, the, what, of people who have endorsed what has been called a transmissive uh, uh, function of the brain in which it trans, transmits consciousness, but it does not make it. Uh, an analogy is a prism that transduces and transmits light, but it doesn't produce the light that's coming in from the other side. This has also been uh, uh, looked at as a, uh, the brain as a filter 
David Darling, uh, the physicist, says that we're conscious not because of the brain, but in spite of it. The idea being that the brain filters out a lot of the good stuff. And what gets through is stuff that helps us survive on this earth as a particular species. I imagine that some of you old unrepentant hippies, uh, among whom I uh, classify myself, read Aldous Huxley back in college or earlier in life. And uh, Huxley really took this idea of the brain as a filter and ran with it. Each one of us is potentially mind at large, he said, but insofar as we are animals, our business at all costs is simply to survive. And to make biological survival possible, mind at large has to be funneled through the reducing valve of the brain and nervous system. So, what comes out at the other end is a measly trickle of the kind of consciousness which will help us to stay alive on the surface of this planet. And so, the idea is to unplug the filter. And throughout history, as everybody in this audience knows, a variety of methods have been experimented with to unplug the filter. Aldous Huck, I mean, uh, Arthur Kessler uh, uh, put it this way, we are peeping toms at the keyhole of eternity, but at least we can try to take the stuffing out of the keyhole, which blocks even our limited view. Now, if we manage somehow to remove the stuffing from the keyhole and we unblock the filter, what do we then experience? Well, I think we experience our non-local mind. And we have intimations of our own mortality. And not uncommonly, we experience incredible bursts of creativity. And the reason we do, I think, is that the filter being unplugged for a while gives us access to a higher pool of information than we would otherwise experience. And so I uh, imagine a collective consciousness with which each individual is connected once the filter is uh, freshened up and once the stuffing is removed from the keyhole. If you think this is a new idea, think again. Emerson said, there is one individual, there's one common mind to all individual men. What Plato has thought, he may think, and what a saint has felt, he may feel. What at any time has befallen any man, he can understand. Who hath access to this universal mind is a party to all that is or can be done. How much more time do I have? Anybody keeping time? We're non-local in time, aren't we? Uh, okay. Now, th this idea that you can link up to something transcendent as the source of your ideas was promoted by America's great inventor, Thomas Edison. People say, I've created things. I've never created anything. And here's the man who gave us moving pictures, the photograph, the electric light bulb, saying he's never created anything. I get impressions from the universe at large and work them out. But I am only a plate on a record or receiving apparatus. Thoughts are really impressions that we get from the outside. Now, I'm stunned when this stuff shows up in children. And uh, I want to give you one example of a sensational uh, uh, representation of what I mean by that. This comes from Joseph Chilton Pierce, who wrote a bunch of books in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he's a, a, a child psychologist. And long story short, when uh, he was in his early 30s and he was teaching humanities in college, he says that he was engrossed in the God-human relationship and the psychology of Jung. He says that he was obsessed with this topic and was reading extensively on it. And here's what happened. One day, he was in his bedroom early one morning preparing for an early morning class. And in comes his five-year-old son into the bedroom, sits down on the edge of the bed, and launches into a 20-minute discussion on the nature of God and man. Here's what Pierce said later. He spoke in perfect, in perfect publishable sentences without pause or haste, and in a flat monotone. He used complex theological terminology. He's five. 
and told me it seemed everything there was to know. As I listened, astonished, the hair rose on my neck. I felt goosebumps, and finally tears streamed down my face. I was in the midst of the uncanny, the inexplicable. My son's ride to kindergarten arrived, horn blowing, and he got up and left. I, I was unnerved and arrived late to my class. My son had no recollection of the event. Go figure. I've got a, f a folder uh, uh, at, in, at home that has dozens of these kinds of uh, reports that have been furnished to me by parents who have experienced something similar. I want to close by talking about some ethical issues that uh, surround this idea of non-local consciousness. There are some spiritual teachers who insist that the belief in survival beyond physical death is not only important for us as human beings, but also it's linked to planetary survival. One of the people who spoke brilliantly about this was Sogal Rinpoche, believing fundamentally that life, this life is the only one, modern people have developed no long-term vision. So there's nothing to restrain people from plundering the planet for their own immediate ends and from living in a selfish way that could prove fatal for the future. I stand with this 100%. So this idea of survival, then, takes on a double meaning. All of a sudden, we're not talking about just the survival of our, uh, our, ourselves, but we're talking about the survival of our planet as well. This has enormous repercussions for health because if we are all non-locally connected, there is always a collective global aspect to personal health. And so individual health choices uh, reverberate at all levels, from the individual to the societal, societal to the global. And I get sort of tired hearing talk, people talk about only personal health because personal health is never merely personal from a non-local point of view because if consciousness is unitary, then the health of one affects the health of everybody else. So the health of this beautiful baby on the left is never totally separate and distinct from the health of these kids in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. And this suggests that the golden rule, I think, ought to be expanded from its usual selfish form, which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, to something like this. Be kind to others, because in some sense, they are you. And I want to suggest to you all that our survival likely depends on whether or not we can sense this idea of unity and connectedness in the heart and in the gut. And the key realization is this. If we're non-locally connected not only with one another, then we are connected with all sentient life. And when we deeply realize this, then all life becomes sacred and precious. And so the unitary one mind, by fostering love for all sentient life and the earth itself, may assist our own survival. So you can slice and dice this any way you wish, but I think that in the end it's all about love. And as Alice Walker, our great novelist, said, anything we love can be saved. Again, this has never been a mystery to poets. Auden said, we must love one another or die. When Aldous Huxley was dying in Southern California, where he lived for a long time, although he was British, his friends and relatives uh, were gathered in the front of the house, and he was in the back room, in his death room. And the people out front selected an emissary to go back and ask him if he had any advice for people who would be left behind. And here's what he said. People often ask me, what is the most effective technique for transforming their life? It's a little embarrassing that after years and years in research and experiment, I have to say that the best answer is 
just be a little kinder. Henry James, the brother of William James, the father of American psychology, said this, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. So let me summarize this. Consciousness research shows us that consciousness is non-local or infinite in space and time. Therefore, in some sense, it is immortal, eternal, and one. The scientific evidence present, but not only permits immortality, it requires it. Immortality is not optional. It's mandatory. This means that immortality isn't acquired. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. It does not kick in with physical death. It is always present. So the conclusion is, in my judgment, that we're all immortal right now. So my summary is that the soul is definitely not obsolete. And I close with a few lines from the great 14th century poet, the Persian poet Hafiz. Let's go deeper, go deeper. For if we do, our spirits will embrace and interweave. Our union will be so glorious that even God will not be able to tell us apart. Thank you.